that could be invested in, in the region to make it more economically sustainable, but also to make the, um, as I say, the management of the, of the region, both at the political level and at the business level, uh, sustainable and, and resilient. Uh, infrastructure, building infrastructure, we should make sure that those are resilient. So after, after a storm, you don't, they don't all disappear and now you have to start all over again. Um, you know, in Turks and Caicos, we've been very fortunate with the last hurricane that we've, we've our source of power is very resilient. I mean, we were literally up when countries were down for up to a year, we were literally up and running within six weeks, you know, after a very, very severe storm. So building resilience in terms of the physical plot, the, the, uh, the infrastructure, but also our systems of government. Um, we, the ability to expand our infrastructure rests to some extent on how we manage procurement. And I believe across the region I'm hearing complaints about the sort of uh, um, um, anemic rate of drawdown on um, public sector investment uh, programs. And so this is where I think we can help each other, the CDB uh, in particular with its pool of, of knowledge and experience and expertise uh, can, can help, uh, particularly some of the smaller countries who may not be able to uh, purchase data within the confines of the, the boundaries of public service uh, pay scales. And, and so there are all sorts of ways that we can help each other to be more resilient. Finally, Premier, the, the CARICOM experience. Whether you're joining us here in person or joining us virtually, welcome to our seminar. I am Camille Taylor, Head of Corporate Communications, and it is my pleasure to have you here with us, whether it's this afternoon or this evening, depending on whichever part of the world you're joining us from. Immediately, I would like to introduce the members of our panel for this <coughs> seminar. Starting on my immediate right, And ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to acknowledge the arrival of the Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands and Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, Mr. Charles, or should I say the Honorable, sir, the Honorable Charles Washington Missick. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the governor of the Turks and Caicos Islands. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> and I'll introduce the panel to start the proceedings. On my immediate right, we have Professor Eric Strobe from the Department of Economics and the Oshenja Center for Climate Change Research, University of Bern, Switzerland. To his right, we have Ambassador Aubrey Webson, Chair of the Alliance of Small Island States and Permanent Representative of Antigua and Barbuda to the United Nations. We have Mr. Ian Durant, Director of Economics at the Caribbean Development Bank, and he will serve as our moderator. Mr. Jason Cotton, Economist with the CDB. 
and Dr. Keith Nurse, the principal of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College and member of the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Our seminar this afternoon is entitled Measuring Vulnerability and Resilience for Small States, the Recovery Duration Adjuster. Now the RDA, as we call it, is a framework which the CDB is developing as a mechanism for ensuring that small developing states, like many of the countries in the Caribbean, can access financing on the terms that consider the challenges we face from external shocks, which can be anything from a Category 5 hurricane to volatile oil, oil prices. The CDB introduced this framework at the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, in the United Kingdom last year. And since then, we've been refining our formulas and developing our methodology. Our proposition <coughs> is for the RDA to be adopted as a global standard for vulnerability and resilience measurement. And today, we will demonstrate the merits of our proposal. We will be, to begin this discussion, we'll have a video presentation. But I'd like to say to our, our audience at home and online, the discussion might get a little technical. The terminology might be sometimes be a little bit complicated. Um, some big words might be in there, some formulas that look a little bit like hieroglyphics. But please understand that behind all of this is a tireless effort to create the best future possible for the people of the Caribbean and other small states. So stay with us throughout the discussion. And it promises to be informative and lively. We're going to start with a video that will set the context and just break down some of the concepts behind the RDA and some of the reasoning why we want to have this framework adopted. After that, our primary presenter, Mr. Jason Cotton, will give a full overview from start to finish of this framework. Then we'll hand it over to our able moderator, Mr. Ian Durand, and he will coordinate the panel discussion on the issue. Then it's back over to you, our audience, online and in person, and we're gonna have a Q&A. And we plan to have a very lively discussion. Now let me just set one per, um, perimeter. We have our audience that is online, we have our audience that is in the house, and this discussion is scheduled to go until five o'clock. If the Q&A in-house gets rigorous and the debate gets going and we want to continue, we'll just sign off for our virtual audience and we can keep going in the, in, in, in the space but we just have to be mindful that we're operating in, in, in two spheres. But there doesn't have to be any limit to the conversation that, that we have here. So without saying anything more, we'll, present the, we'll give the video presentation and then we'll get right into the discussion. Thank you. Vibrant but vulnerable at the same time, the Caribbean faces a unique challenge on the global stage. As small coastal states, the countries of the region are extremely exposed to the effects of external shocks such as natural disasters, economic crises, and pandemics. And the impact of such shocks lingers on for far longer than it would in a larger country with more resources and a more diversified economy. The devastation wrought by an experience such as a catastrophic storm can wipe out decades of economic progress in hours, and recovery can be a long way off. This is the everyday lived reality for the people of the Caribbean. And for some, it is a reality they have personally lived through. During Maria, it was really tough. In the shelter, in the home we were in, the wind started coming in, rain started coming in, and we started panicking. When I came up in the morning to look around, I couldn't recognize the place. Everything was destroyed, totally. I came and look out, I told him, then I told him, Gucci, everything is gone. Everything is gone. For policymakers, the task of rebuilding after a shock, like a natural disaster, is a long and multifaceted process, lasting long after tarpaulins have been removed and homes rebuilt. The shocks keep coming. 
And also very important to note is the magnitude of those shocks. I always give the example. Ivan in Grenada, 2004. Maria in Dominica, 226% of GDP in 2017. In contrast, Hurricane Katrina in the United States in 2005, 1% of GDP. Two countries destroyed, a small portion of a state in the United States destroyed. That is the magnitude of these shocks on our economies. So why do we take longer to recover? Because the shocks keep coming and the magnitude is large, proportionately far larger than it would be in a large country or economy. These experiences underscore the challenges in current global mechanisms used to determine access to concessional financing, which do not take into account the multidimensional nature of vulnerability in the Caribbean. Recently, the Caribbean Development Bank Economics Department, we undertook some And the analysis, in a sense, sought to investigate how long it took our borrowing member countries to return to their pre-shock level of GDP after the crisis. And the analysis revealed that on average, it took our borrowing member countries five years to recover to their pre-shock level of GDP. And in some instances, some countries uh, took as long as nine years to recover. Now, when we compare that to advanced countries, the advanced countries were able to recover to their pre-shock level of GDP in about three years. The gross national income is the current metric that is used to assess uh, a country's level of access to concessional finance. And we think that this uh, GNI does not adequately assess the current state of development in the country. And we think so for several reasons. <coughs> Firstly, when there's a devastation, as you know, let's say a devastation or natural hazard, for example, that happened in a Dominica that contributed uh, more than 200% in GDP of devastation. I mean, it literally wiped out the country. In a situation like that, income becomes relatively meaningless. It doesn't say anything about your state of development. In addition to that, it does not capture the long time that it takes for a country to recover. Those years when the country is recovering, the country's pre-shock level of GNI does not help it in any way. And as a result, we believe that we need metrics that better capture this lived reality of many of our borrowing member countries in order to access their state of development. So this is why we think that there needs to be a, a more suitable measure. The CDB is proposing the recovery duration adjuster as a more suitable indicator because we think that an indicator to measure development needs to go beyond looking at just the susceptibility of the country to a natural hazard. We need to also include the uh, resilience factors. What, are the, what is the country doing in order to build resilience to these shocks? Yes, there were inherent vulnerabilities before, but this shock now, this shock now changes the nature of those vulnerabilities and it also affects the resilience conditions. So we believe that the framework needs to incorporate these changes and it needs to consider as well access to finances because access to finances will be a key uh, ingredient in how long it takes for the country to build resilience and for them to recover. And because these are the key elements of the recovery duration adjuster, we're proposing this as an improved measure. When a country faces a shock, liquidity is paramount. Countries need resources to be able to expedite recovery. And so the issue of access to finance, grants and concessional finance, assumes extremely great significance. And that is why it is an analytical absurdity to rely on per capita income to consider and determine access to grants and concessional financing for the small states of the Caribbean. It is time, high time, that we move away from that flawed basis. And I welcome the focus of the CDB on the duration adjuster to better address 
what is a pressing and long-standing need of the Boring member countries and countries of the Caribbean. Distinguished governors, excellencies, observers, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, both in attendance and online. My name is Jason Cotton, and today my presentation would provide to you further insight into the Recovery Duration Adjuster, or RVA. In the presentation today, I would seek to explain to you how the Recovery Duration Adjuster RVA seeks to improve upon the Multidimensional Vulnerability Index. And for those of you who may not be aware, the Multidimensional Vulnerability Index is the framework that is being proposed by the international community to either replace or to be used with the GNI in order to determine access to concessional I will also explain to you the conceptual underpinnings of the RVA, how we believe that it can influence access to concessional finance, and the way forward and the partnerships that we are seeking. But I want to begin today's discussion by highlighting three important ideas. And the first idea relates to the need to make the multidimensional vulnerability index better by incorporating both vulnerability and resilience in the framework. The second big idea that we'd be speaking today about is the importance of resilience building in the sustainable development of a developing country and small development states. And the third uh, big idea relates to the need for an adequate financing system to assist countries in achieving their sustainable development objectives. And I would build on these three ideas during the course of this presentation. And the argument we are making at the bank is that while the existing multidimensional vulnerability index or MVI being proposed is an improvement to the GNI, the, the current system that influences access to concessional finance. It does not go far enough in terms of capturing the realities of small island development states. And so what we are saying is that this RDA, Recovery Duration Adjuster, has been designed to make the MVI better by incorporating the dimensions of not only vulnerability or the susceptibility of a country, but also the critical aspect of resilience building. And this is what you see in the graph before you. Uh, the RDA goes beyond vulnerability to consider the various dimensions of resilience building in its framework. Now this is well known to you, so I won't spend a lot of time here, but the basis is that finance eligibility criteria and systems, they're not suited to the unique challenges and constraints of small states. Even when small states have high levels of GNI, they still face significant challenges because of exogenous shocks. This is well known to this group. In designing the RDA, we also considered three critical imperatives in the design. And the first is the need for a bridge between stabilization and long-term development. And we believe that in developing this bridge, the framework needs a holistic approach, a holistic approach that integrates the debt sustainability framework of the IMF, the investment growth framework of the World Bank, and the resilience building framework of the United Nations. And we believe that integrating these three frameworks are critical in order to influence access to finance. The second critical imperative is that 
Sustainable development is about improving the quality of life and the capabilities of, of person. And an important component of that is the need to build resilience. We make the argument that the structural deficiencies of our region are there in part because of inadequacies of resilience building. And as such, what we are advocating <coughs> in the framework is that any concept that seeks to give a, a, a sense of development must incorporate, must be holistic and incorporate all of the areas of resilience. We identify five in the RDA, five areas of resilience, and the design must incorporate all of those dimensions of resilience, even though in the execution, the execution may be in a temporarily coherent manner. And the final critical imperative of the framework is that we cannot achieve, next slide, we cannot achieve a sustainable development without access to a financing ecosystem that provides access to adequate and affordable finance to meet the development needs of the region. And here we propose in this financing ecosystem that there be a various categories of finance. Finance for rescue, financing for recovery, and financing for repositioning, and various instruments in each of these categories of finance. Now, today, we are speaking about access to concessional finance. But we, we're not speaking about access to concessional finance in a way that creates a dependency on donor resources. Rather, the argument that we are making is that this concessional finance will be used for much needed resilience building and so help to transition countries from the place of stabilization to the place of long-term development. So we are proposing through our RDA a vulnerability and resilience framework that goes beyond the susceptibility to our shock to consider how the country is building resilience, its ability to bounce back from the shock. And we are doing so because we observe that in the region and further afield, our countries are being struck by shocks that are decimating their capital stock, uh, wiping out their productivity, and this is constraining their development. And we have several examples of that. Many of these examples of this wipeout risk because of an exogenous shock are known to you. So I would, I would move on. We also utilize the comparison of Florida and Dominica. Now we have the state of Florida and we have the country of Dominica. And we know that both of these are susceptible to a category five hurricane, but we ask you the question, and we ask ourselves the question, who do you think would rebound faster? And we are saying that the answer to that question is, is the key in this recovery duration adjuster methodology. We propose, and you know, that it is very likely that Florida, and the, and the, the statistics tell us, will recover faster than, for example, a Dominica for several reasons, because in, in Dominica, a smaller island constrained, there would be uh, deficiencies in terms of infrastructure, uh, limited access to finance, lower capital uh, efficiencies, et cetera. And these, in part, constrain the time period for recovery. Next slide, please. So, the recovery duration adjuster integrates vulnerability and resilience in a dynamic and a forward-looking manner. And key to this framework is what we refer to as the internal resilience capacity. And I explain that internal resilience capacity as we, as we go on. One slide back, please. So it's important at this stage to distinguish uh, 
how the RDA is different from the multidimensional vulnerability index. In fact, we refer to the RDA as MVI plus uh, because it goes, it does not discard the MVI, but it goes beyond what the MVI has proposed. And it does so in several ways. Firstly, it is holistic and multidimensional in terms of its approach. I explained a little bit in terms of the design, how we seek to incorporate uh, that holistic perspective as compared to the partial approach of the MVI. Secondly, the RDA can be customized to specific shocks. And this is important. The RDA can be customized to a shock, whether that shock is a, a natural hazard, whether it is an earthquake, whether it is a tsunami, whether it is a volcanic eruption. Once we have the data, we can customize the RDA to the specific shock of the country situation, which is a very different to an index, which is static and fixed and has inherent uh, shortcomings. In addition to that, the, the RDA enables real-time analysis, which is critical for the policymaker. Uh, indexes by nature, they are static. They are backward-looking. But the RDA provides the policymaker with the opportunity to uh, have a glimpse into the contemporaneous effects of a shock on the economy. And so it is better, therefore, can assist better in policymaking. It is forward-looking uh, as compared to the backward-looking approach of an index. It incorporates this very important aspect of internal resilience capacity. And this internal resilience capacity examines the structural inherent weaknesses of the country. It also looks at a shock and the impact that the shock has on the country in terms of how it affects those vulnerabilities and resilience and how those change as a result of the shock. And it also takes into consideration what access to finance this country has and how that influences its uh, duration of recovery. And the RDA, of course, uh, central to it is this idea of duration of recovery. And that is not in the uh, MVI. So in this slide, we, we uh, summarize the, the RDA framework. And what we are saying, in essence, in this slide is that the traditional measure of gross national income, it is not adequate as a measure to access or determine access to concessional finance. We are proposing this RDA-adjusted GNI measure as a more appropriate measure. And in this RDA, we have several components. The, the RDA considers shocks. Those shocks could be endogenous as well as exogenous shocks. But as we well know, it is the exogenous shocks. Those would be the ones that would be focused on if we're speaking about access to concessional finance. It also looks at the state of vulnerability in the country in all dimensions, economic, social, and environmental. It takes into consideration the event or the shock, the magnitude of that shock, the severity of that shock, but also what uh, resilience or shock absorbing mechanisms the country has in place in order to mitigate that shock. Because that, in essence, is what would determine the duration of recovery. And once we have a sense of the, the time that it takes for that country to uh, return to what we refer to as its pre-shock level of GNI, what we do then is we utilize a framework referred to as compensating variation. In essence, all that is doing, it is putting a dollar value to that duration of time. And that is what is used, that dollar value, to adjust the gross national income. Hence the name, Recovery Duration Adjuster. And so in this graph, we just illustrate uh, the, the principle here. What we're seeing is that our countries, small island developing states, developing countries, <coughs> on their development pathway, the development path is being reflected by the black line in the graph. But when a shock occurs, we refer to that black line as the baseline or the natural growth path. When a shock occurs, what happens is that that development pathway is changed and it pivots downwards to the red line. So in, the, in this instance here, 
Let's call this country Dominica. In the year 2017, there was an exogenous shock. The exogenous shock contributes to a reduction in the productive capacity of the, of the country. Its marginal efficiency of investment is affected. And as a result, the country now pivots to this uh, red line. Now, it's important to observe what is happening here. During the period of time, 2017 to 2028, the country's uh, development pathway causes its income per capita to be beneath the 8,000 level of income per capita before the shock. But what is happening, and our argument is that during this rescue and recovery period, during this 11-year period from 2017 to 2028, and the numbers are just illustrative, the, the country, we are saying, should not be assessed on that 8,000 level of GNI. Because during that time, the productive capacity is significantly changed. And what we are seeking to <coughs> estimate is those two colored areas in the graph. The structural cumulative loss, which refers to those inherent uh, vulnerabilities and how those inherent vulnerabilities affect welfare in the country, as well as when there is a shock, the shock would be associated with additional losses. And it is these two uh, categories of losses, the cumulative, the structural cumulative loss and the post-shock cumulative loss that we are trying to quantify. And once we get a cost value for that, we then proposing that this cost is what is being used to uh, take away from the GNI to get this adjusted figure. So we introduce another illustration. And here we're seeing another scenario that is very familiar to most persons. Some countries, when they are hit by a shock, for example, in 2017, and the country is on the path to recovery, again, this red line, the country sometimes, unfortunately, may be hit by another shock. And, and we're, we're showing that, for example, here in the year 2023, let us say, when the country is on the recovery path, unfortunately, it is struck by another shock which contributes to a further reduction in productive capacity and further extends this duration of recovery. So as a result, because of this multiple shock scenario, the duration of recovery has been extended um, from 2028 to the year 2033. And we are saying that with this uh, extension in the duration of recovery, of course, the cumulative cost to the country during this period would have increased. So, I mean, this is the part where most persons would want to zone out. So, so, so I'm just talking you through the logic of it. I'm not, I promise I'm not going to go into any of the symbols, right? But all, all, we're, saying, all we're seeing here is that, remember the black line that you would have seen before, right? The black line is this baseline development trajectory. We're seeing that in order to compute this baseline development trajectory, we're looking at the vulnerabilities in the country and in the economic, social, and environmental dimensions, and we're looking at the various aspects of resilience. So this is the first step of the six steps in the RDA methodology. In the second step, so now we're on the red line. The red line, the shock has occurred. And so now what we're trying to quantify is the, how this shock and the associated costs related to the shock. So we're seeing this internal resilience capacity relative to the red line that you would have seen is equivalent to the change in gross national income that is caused by the shock. We look at the initial vulnerability factors. We look at how those vulnerability factors would have changed because of the shock. We look at the initial resilience capacity. We look at how that resilience capacity would have changed because of the shock. And we also take into consideration the magnitude and the severity of the shock and the country's access to finance. The third step 
is we calculate the structural cumulative loss. Again, remember the diagram, there were those two colored parts. So we, we're just adding the colored part on the top with the colored part on the bottom. The structural cumulative loss with the post-structural cumulative loss. The internal resilience capacity cumulative loss, what we're doing is that we are saying that when we quantify that pre-shock uh, development part, we are, we are taking the cumulative differential of that pre-shock cumulative part from the pre-shock GNI level. I know that one may have gone over a few persons' heads, but just stay with me here. The, the fifth, the fifth uh, dimension is we calculate the, the, the total cumulative loss. And the total cumulative loss, again, is just the addition of the structural cumulative loss and the post-shock cumulative loss. So all the res losses related to the uh, various uh, dimensions in the graph. And the final step, the sixth step, is the internal resilience capacity adjusted, GNI, whereby we take the gross national income and we multiply that by the ratio of the post-shock uh, development part over the pre-shock development part. Next slide, please. There's a lot happening on this slide. I'm not going to go through it. The point that we're trying to make on this slide is that we explain in the economic, social, environmental dimensions of vulnerability, and under the various uh, components of resilience, we highlight them. Uh, we can come back if persons have questions, but I think what's important to take away here is this point. The recovery duration adjuster does not seek to uh, be innovative in terms of these indicators. In fact, we try to align the indicators as much as possible with the indicators that the UN and other frameworks would utilize in order to ensure uh, universality in terms of the data that goes in. The main innovation is in terms of the methodological framework and how we capture this uh, duration to recovery. And here we explain how this recovery duration adjuster vulnerability and resilience framework can help us to move from the use of gross national income to internal resilience capacity as the measure to influence access to concessional finance. So we begin with the recovery duration adjuster. As I said, that is the first component. The recovery duration adjuster allows us to cost this financing gap related to the shock and the pre-shock scenario. But we don't stop there. We, we, we go beyond that costed value to now look at uh, a vulnerability and resilience assessment tool. And in this assessment tool, what we are seeking to do is go behind that costed number to get a better sense as to what is driving these vulnerabilities, what is driving the resilience. Why is this duration capacity uh, so long? So we can liken that second component to like a, a financial stability assessment, which takes a deeper dive into the financial sector in that case. Then we go further. That allows us to uh, determine policy, key policy recommendations that allows us in component three to develop a roadmap for monitoring and tracking progress of countries as they move from stabilization to long-term development. And the fourth and most important component is this internal resilience capacity index. And this internal resilience capacity index, what we seek to do is similar to the GNI, which has various thresholds for determining uh, where countries have access or do not have access to concessional finance. We utilize uh, in economics a, a panel methodology place all of the countries that we can find data on, the, 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 the countries now based on this recovery duration adjuster, adjusted GNI, helps to now determine internal resilience capacity adjusted thresholds for countries uh, and where they, access to, where they have access to concessional finance. And that is what we now can possibly help to determine uh, uh, which countries and how access to finance is determined in this new methodology. 
this is a bit about, about the vulnerability and resilience assessment tool. For the sake of time, I will just go to the final slide. The reconfiguration adjuster vulnerability and resilience framework really helps to uh, enable what we are thinking about as an improved mechanism to uh, influence how countries access to concessional, have access to concessional finance. And this is what we, we, we're trying to illustrate here. And the final slide I want to say is that, you know, the bank, we have made a lot of progress in terms of our in terms of our RDA. And we are, we have some preliminary uh, estimates which we're refining, but I think the critical thing is coming out of this uh, discussion today, we are seeking partnerships. We have explained our framework to several partners, to EOSIS, we uh, had conversations with the United Nations, uh, with ECLAC, et cetera. But I, a key outcome of this is for others to come on board with us in what we see as an exciting journey as we seek to provide a what we think is a more appropriate measure to access concessional finance. So join with us on this journey. Hashtag recovery duration adjuster. Jason for Thank you, Jason, for that, um, that presentation, which I anticipate will set the stage for a robust um, conversation. Good afternoon. My name is Ian Durant, I'm, and I am your moderator. Uh, so that was some heavy stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so let me, let me just try to break it down for you. Uh, in essence, there are three things that you need to consider when assessing the impact of a shock on a country uh, and assessing the separate the, the, the issues that separate one country from the next. There's the possibility or the probability of uh, a shock affecting the country, the extent of the, the shock, and the duration of the, the impact. So we are basically arguing that if you use today's GNI to determine a country's access to concessional resources for the next 10 years, you're pretty much ignoring the probability, the extent, and the duration of a shock that could occur within that 10-year period uh, for which you are assessing uh, impact, right? Um, so. This is very, very critical because what it means is that a country might have limited, a country that looks extremely wealthy might have limited um, access today. Uh, but because of a shock over the next 10 years, uh, its growth is affected. And let's say, for example, it has to access uh, um, commercial at, uh, debt at commercial rates, let's say 6, 7, 8 percent, um, and it's experiencing growth. Uh, on, on average of about 2%. What that does is that it builds an explosiveness into the debt to GDP ratio of the country. So you're pretty much, you're pretty much forcing, pushing a country potentially into a debt overhang situation or worsening a debt overhang situation by cutting off access to concessional resources by judging it on today's um, GNI. So that's basically what we are arguing with the, um, with the RDA. So, so having said that, I am very excited to engage this esteemed panel. Uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to have two rounds of uh, questions. Uh, I'm going to ask the, the, the panel uh, two rounds of questions, and then I'm going to open it up. I'm going to open it up to uh, the audience here and the um, and the online audience. You you want to say something? Okay, so we're going to allow the president. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I, I thought I was in charge, but clearly I'm not. <laughs> We're going to allow the president <laughs> to make a few remarks as well. <laughs> I see you are wearing your glasses. You couldn't see me. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to the slide with the duration gap. I know Ian gave us a lot of information, and he did a terrific job in doing this. But I think there are a couple of things we need to get, a couple of things we need to unpack. The, the first thing is, what exactly are we trying to do? One is what do we have now, which is a GNI method of allocating finance, concessional finance, can be summarized in two numbers. If your GNI is less than 1,200 US dollars per capita, you qualify for concessional finance. If it is twice that number, $2,400 US dollars per capita, you graduate, you do not qualify. That's the bottom line. And in between, you have a shade of gray where you may or may not, depending on some other things. The fundamental problem is that our countries, in principle, have all graduated. And therefore, they do not have access to concessional finance. So what we are looking for is a more equitable method of channeling, allocating that concessional finance. And so in principle, forget all the symbols that Jason had on the screen. We want something that says, let's replace GNI by something else. And that something else will be internal resilience capacity. And we want to do the same thing we did for GNI, two magic numbers. For example, if the internal resilience capacity is less than 0.3, you qualify. Just like 1,200, less than 1,200, you qualify. If it is more than 0.6, just like more than 2,400, you do not qualify. And if you fall in between, it's error there. Okay, so that, that's the ultimate goal. We want to be able to say, replace GNI by internal resilience capacity. So once we understand that this is what we are trying to do, and we want to replace it by the same switch points, the two thresholds, the question is, what's the difference between GNI and internal resilience capacity? <laughs> now, the world understands GNI as this. <coughs> that line. It's a number. Now, what exactly does that number say? It says the activity that occurs in your country on a year-by-year -year basis determines your gross national income. Now, having established, having established that GNI is not equivalent to development, and having established that GNI does not mean financing need, the community of institutions, spearheaded by my good friend here, Dr. Nurse, I'm not putting you on the spot. <laughs> have, said, have said that what we need to do, what we need to do is to come up with a multi-dimensional vulnerability index. Now, forget the nice fancy word multi-dimensional. A vulnerability index. Now, you might want to say, what does a vulnerability index do and what does it say? And again, I want to show you this on this line. What a vulnerability index says is that you are on this black line because you are vulnerable. And in the slide, just if you go forward to, in the slide with the various, one more, come, keep going, keep going, keep going. 
This guy. No, one more. Two more, actually. One more. Oh, you have a lot more slides. Right, there. What the vulnerability index says is if you have low export concentration, if you are remote, if your population is lying in low coastal areas, if your share of agriculture and forestry is low, go back to the duration gap, then what this means is that your ability to grow, one more, yeah, good. Your ability to grow is limited, limited. Therefore, in principle, you should be out here, up above that line. That's your true potential. In other words, developed countries should be up here. We as developing countries are down here. Why? Because of the vulnerabilities, the constraints that prevent you from growing. So all of that is good. But all it says is, if I take a snapshot of where you are, what I am arguing is, you are not growing as good, as strong, as fast as you can because of vulnerabilities. And I end up measuring those vulnerabilities. So it's a measure of why you cannot grow as much as you should. But here's where the rubber hits the fence. When the hurricane passes through, or the drought passes through, the shock occurs, pandemic, Ukraine war, the global financial crisis, Maria, Irma. What happens at that point? Can you genuinely say that this line, which was why you were not able to grow as fast, is still relevant? And the answer to that is categorically no. Because your entire situation has changed. Your entire situation has changed. And so what we are looking to do is to say, before the event, the natural hazard or other shock occurs, vulnerability as we are talking about it is appropriate. It tells us why we are not able to grow the way we could grow, potential-wise. But once the shock occurs and you hit and fall, as in the case of Dominica, then you cannot say anymore that the vulnerability line you are on is the same. You have been pushed down, and you push down now from the black line to the red line. And so the relevant question now is not how much you could grow, but really how long it will take you after the shock to get back to where you were before the shock. Okay? And that element here, which is the length of time, the duration it takes, depends critically, we believe, on one factor, which is access to finance. And so the point about the Florida and the Dominica example that Jason raised is very appropriate. The same Category 5 hurricane hits Dominica and hits Florida. Okay? You cannot talk about susceptibility as any difference. They are exactly the same. But after it hits, one state gets crashed. In another case, an entire country gets crashed. And we heard only a couple of days ago, 75 to 85% of the 30,000 homes in Dominica in 2017 were destroyed. Now, not as many percentage-wise were destroyed in Florida, but the key difference was that after Maria hit, Florida had access to FEMA funds, access to concessional finance that enabled them to recover faster. Therefore, that duration was 
shrunk. Okay, that duration was shrunk. So we are making the point that by adding this duration, and that duration itself is a function of the capacity to recover. That's what we are calling the internal resilience capacity. And we can do that for every country in the world. And I can tell you what we will end up with is developed countries will have high capacity to recover. Less developed countries will have low capacity to recover, irrespective of their per capita income. Because when the hurricane comes and it crashes, it doesn't distinguish whether you had high or low per capita income. And so that is what we are trying to do to distinguish between the two particular elements. Okay? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, President Leon, for that, that intervention. So let's get going um, with the panel. As I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with an initial round of, um, of questions for each panelist. And I'm going to start with uh, Ambassador Webson. Uh, now, EOSIS is a key player in supporting small island development, developing states in their advocacy for increased access to concessional finance to support sustainable development. <coughs> this role has become more important in the context of the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and building resilience against future uh, shocks. How, in your opinion, can the RDA framework support the ongoing work of EOSIS? Ambassador? Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Distinguished governors, excellencies, colleagues, friends in the room and online. I don't know if I could um, replicate the zoning probability of Jason. I hope you don't zone out or zone in, but I hope you stay with us. Because this is for us a very important topic and most importantly, something that we want to see bring, come through to be a reality for small island developing states as we have been working at this for decades. Without any doubt, Mr. Moderator, the small island developing states are, most, are amongst the most vulnerable group of countries in the global community that are experiencing severe shocks from COVID-19 pandemic and worsening shocks brought on by climate change. Access to global finance, um, such as um, concessional financing or climate financing and debt relief for these islands are difficult. These we believe should mirror the unique and extreme vulnerabilities of the islands. Yet, today, as you have been hearing, access falls woefully short for many of these islands, especially the islands in the Caribbean, despite the very clear evidence that the access mechanism being used, which denies opportunity and access to finances, as noted above, is unjust. We are referring here as we speak in this conversation somewhat to um, the COVID-19 pandemic and to climate change. And of course, the climate is, uh, is, is, is important to us and is at the forefront of our consciousness because we know from our climatologist that in the Caribbean, we are likely to experience a major climate disaster in one island or the other every two to three years. The vulnerability shocks that we face is not something new. It's, it's not new to us. We know that these shocks create great human toll on our societies and significant suffering and the dollar value is exponential. 
In fact, though, the Alliance of Small Island States, um, those of you who do not know of the Alliance of Small Island States, is a small group of all of the small, 39 small island nations in the United Nations family that came together over 30 years ago, initially built around its claim for climate change, and we will say to the globe that had it not been for the Alliance of Small Island States, we would not be speaking of climate change in the manner that we are today. And that group came together and has mushroomed and developed into a strong alliance within the United Nations system that now takes on sustainable development, oceans, and climate change. EOSIS has been advocating for multi-dimensional vulnerability index for decades, as I said. For we hope, however, with the momentum that we have gained and the United Nations Secretary General appointing with, this, with the, um, president of the, 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 the president of the General Assembly appointing a expert panel, that this panel will develop a framework that will finally recognize, recognize and gain recognition on the special circumstances of small island developing states across multiple dimensions. And just not, and, and be, uh, most importantly, that it is a universal index that is inclusive of all countries so as to um, demonstrate what we already know already that the extent of our vulnerability is, um, is relatively, is, is like none other group of countries for a number of the points already identified. Now let me turn my attention a little bit to the RDA as we have been discussing the vulnerability index um, more, more urgently with the panel recently and had the CDB work with us um, um, as they have indicated as part of their discussion. The, uh, the RDA of the CDB, their, their framework has for us, we believe, the potential to, be, to, be, to, to increase access to financing and um, um, improves um, the resilience in vulnerable countries. Oh, and this, this will be done, we believe, over time as we work together. If, for instance, the RDA indicates a country's um, resilience in, uh, uh, to, will be improved, then it supports the conclusion that access to finance has helped countries overcome their vulnerabilities by making these countries more resilient to external shocks. You have heard how external shocks, how small island states are exposed to some, and I will speak to that further. Because of the lack of global data coverage, not all of the indicators used in the RDA might be transferable to the MVI. But the underlying methodology, we believe, is sound. In, 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 in fact, the MVI structure currently being contemplated by the United Nations expert panel will have a, a, a component allowing countries to develop more personalized, if you might, in-depth resilience um, profiles. And, and, and I can foresee that the, uh, the CDB through the RDA helping and playing a great role in the Caribbean to develop these um, in each country's respective profile. In this way, Mr. Moderator, resilience and the RDA framework may complement strongly the MVI that measures and, uh, and, and appreciates the vulnerability of, of that we seek to, uh, to improve access to finance. We may have to work together and develop models in order to prove concept so that the international community can fully appreciate this, the, the, the use of a new MVI and the co coordination between the RDA and the MVI. I thank you. Thank you, Ver. <coughs> thank you very much, Ambassador 
Webson for reminding us that SIDS are uh, uh, among the most vulnerable um, countries in the world to shocks. And it is not only important for SIDS to have greater access to concessional resources, but it is just for them to do so. Um, you reminded us that uh, EOSIS has been advocating for increased access for years and that there's an expert panel currently uh, looking at the issue of a universal vulnerability index. So uh, thank you for that. And of course, thank you for the endorsement of the RDA as a, a solid basis uh, for assessing vulnerability and resilience and improving access to resources. So I'm gonna turn now to our second panelist, Dr. Keith Nurse, and I'm gonna ask him, uh, Dr. Nurse, the RDA framework emphasized the need for SIDS to have expanded access to financing for development to support building resilience against exogenous shocks, including climate change and natural hazards and the expansion of productive capacity while ensuring the sustainability of external debt. In your opinion, how important is resilience in fostering sustainable development in SIDS? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, thanks very much to the panelists and, uh, and to the CDB for the invitation to contribute to this, I think, really important discussion about a concept which I think, uh, and I would say at the outset, I think has strong uh, methodological capabilities to enhance our understanding of how to, um, to take the motto for this meeting um, to do better um, measurement and consequently do better targeting um, and, and why 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 is measurement so important and targeting so important it allows us to plan and it also allows us to implement and you know one of the challenges for small states uh, and particularly here in the Caribbean is what I call the implementation deficit disorder uh, which is that um, we have no shortage of plans, um, but our capacity to implement has often been compromised by a whole range of things. Uh, I'm not gonna get into that um, specifically now. So one of the things that strikes me about the RDA concept, in fact, which I like, um, but particularly the way it then is nuanced in terms of looking at the internal uh, resilience capacity, and I think that this is where the rubber hits the ground. Um, because for a long time, uh, for small states, we have harped on the issue of vulnerability. Going all the way back to the Commonwealth, um, doing a publication back in the 1980s um, on vulnerability. And even back then, we were arguing that um, there are different kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, they're in, they're in vulnerabilities that are inherent. So the Caribbean is inherently vulnerable to hurricanes. We can't move the island, and um, we can't tell the hurricanes to stop coming. Maybe the Sahara does has a different idea altogether, and it's, you know, it's tempering things a bit. Mm -hmm. so, so one disaster on top of another. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but the point is this. Um, there's another way of thinking about vulnerabilities, which is that there are courted vulnerabilities. So if you know that you're inherently vulnerable to hurricanes and you don't do hurricane preparedness, then what you are doing is courting further vulnerabilities. So the issue is not whether or not there's a risk or you have an exposure, sorry, you have an exposure. We are exposed to this risk question is, what are you doing about it? And if you are not doing the preparedness, then you are courting vulnerability. And I think that's the key point. So what strikes me about the RDA adjuster and this um, coming up with a new methodological framework called an internal uh, resistance um, framework is that it gives us a new way of thinking and possibly a new way of 
of responding um, to the level of exposure and risk that we have by being um, forward-looking, which is the point that Jason made in his presentation, um, and in effect using our planning frameworks to ensure that we uh, mitigate the exposures and the risk. And so, I want, in that sense, I really want to compliment the, um, the work that's being done by the CDB. One of the hats that I wear, uh, which my good friend, the president, um, referred to and called me out on, um, I'm on one of the UN committees. It's the UN Committee for Development Policy. And we are the ones that assess countries for graduation from least developed country status. And so we use many of these methodologies that Jason referred to. In fact, we use um, three key indicators. Um, GNI, um, we use the Human Asset Index, which includes things like education, health, and other social factors. Um, and then the third, as an, an Environmental or Economic Vulnerability Index, or the EVI. And what we have found is this. In the last several decades, um, in relation to least developed countries, it is, it is the small states within the least developed country category that have graduated. So at the same time that we are saying that small states are the most vulnerable, it is the small states among the least developed country categories that have been the ones to graduate. So for example, um, Botswana was first, 1994, Cap Verde, 2007, the Maldives, 2011, Samoa in 2014, Equatorial Guinea in 2017, Vanuatu um, was due to graduate in 2020. That has obviously had to be deferred um, a bit. So it's small states, and the reason why is this. You only need to have two of the criteria to graduate. And so in small states, what you find is that if you have a particular economy that's in many cases, they're often monostructural uh, or mono economies. So the tourism sector can generate high levels of GNI, and the spillover or some of the surplus from that can, can easily be redistributed into the educational sector, the health sector, the infrastructure, and so on. So small states that have uh, mono economies, in particularly through boom years, can generate significant growth in their human asset index. This is far more difficult for least developed countries that are larger, with large populations, large rural populations, and so on, and high levels of poverty historically. Mm -hmm. So the small states within the least developed country category have been the ones that have been able to pull vault out of the least developed country category for this very reason. Where they remain vulnerable, however, is in the EVI, the Economic and Environmental Vulnerability Indices. And so one of the concerns that we have at the UN Committee for Development Policy, and I'm, and I'm speaking on my own personal capacity here, um, is that there's a strong potential, particularly with all of the, the exposures and risks that we see with climate change, that many of these um, small states may reverse mm -hmm. from graduating out of the LDC category. Mm -hmm. If all the climatologists are correct, then um, there's great concern. And you can well imagine, countries like Maldives are already indicating that they are sinking or going to disappear. Tuvalu, Kiribati. Um, so one of the concerns that we have is, how can you graduate a country that you know is going to be severely impacted. Uh, what I mean severely impacted, I'm, in some instances we're talking about almost disappearing off the planet. Uh, and so this is a grave concern for us. Uh, and in that regard, the issue of the internal resistance um, capacity. Mm -hmm. capacity. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
becomes the key indicator or should be the driving or, 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 or key indicator that we're using going forward. Which reminds me of the work of um, Amartya Sen, who talks about capabilities in terms of generating um, wellness and well-being. So it, let us get away from economic growth, um, that framework that we've been using for, for decades now um, has severe limitations uh, going forward if we take all of the sustainability issues that we have been talking about for the last uh, few decades, um, because planet Earth can no longer continue to sustain human activity in the way in which it's currently configured, the strong fossil fuel use and so forth. So if we're using capacities and capabilities in, in general in the same ways, um, it means then we need to be thinking about how do we restructure our economies and societies so that they are more sustainable and generate the kind of resilience we're talking about. Uh, so the, the, the issue though is not just about access to finance. I know we are at a bank meeting and so banks like to talk about finance. <laughs> But banks also like to talk about return on investment. Because if there is not an adequate return on the investment, then the financing doesn't look good. Uh, um, and so how do we ensure that the productive capacity of these economies and the processes of social innovation on in these societies are such that when we invest in them, when we use the concessional financing, that we get an increased or improved return on investment. And so, um, although I like the RDA, um, the concept of recovery for me is not the real issue. It's, we have to think beyond recovery to think about how do we reinvent these economies. If you look at all the indicators for Caribbean um, economies, we have the highest debt to GDP ratio. We have the highest food import bill per capita, our use of energy, imported energy, high, especially in a context where, you know, we have natural sunlight, we should be utilizing renewables to a greater degree, et cetera. I think I go down the list. Hmm? These are vulnerabilities that we are courting because we are not investing fast enough in renewables. We're not investing fast enough and strategically enough in feeding ourselves. Uh, and so the longer that we court those vulnerabilities, the higher the level of exposure and risk, and we are courting them. Uh, so th it's our responsibility, and this is where I like the, the, the role that the CDB is playing as a champion to push this and to implement it so that we start thinking about how do we ensure that these countries can bounce back, but bounce back better, um, but bounce back through a process of innovation. Let's call it mission-oriented innovation. I know that last year your feature lecture speech, uh, speech, um, speaker was Mariana Mascuto, who was a former member of the UN Committee for Development Policy. And so it's that kind of framework, very strategic. Let us identify where our vulnerabilities are and convert them into um, resilience um, frameworks. So I'll, I'll end my comments for now, um, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nurse. Um, some very profound points you made, uh, reminding us that countries are being graduated in full view of existential challenges. Um, and indicating as well that while it is important to increase access to concessional resources, it is important that there is a return on the investment uh, in terms of the use of those resources in the form of higher growth and less uh, vulnerability. So I thank you for those interventions. And if I may now turn to the third panelist, Professor uh, Strobel. Now, based on your extensive research on the impact and policy implications of extreme climate events in the Caribbean, how do you see your research findings complementing the ongoing work at the CDB on 
uh, the vulnerability and resilience framework. Well, thank you very much for that question, Mr. Moderator, and for all the panelists and the interesting discussion so far, and the CDB for setting this up and inviting me. Um, let me just say, when I first saw this presentation, my first thought was kind of, if I'd seen this 15 years ago when I started doing research, this would have saved me a lot of trouble. Then, of course, I realized I would have been re researching something else because most of it would have been done. And uh, let me clarify a bit what I mean by that. So when I first started off, I was a little bit naive because I was interested in the impact of extreme climate events in the Caribbean. And so I took that same sort of approach. You know, you look at GDP or GNI, whichever the data are, and you think there's an impact, and then it recovers, and that's about it. And so what originally I and other researchers for other regions found, you find this kind of very large impact. But then when you start looking in the medium term, the data just gets very noisy, right? And what I realized at that stage then is you really have to kind of open up that black box to look inside with more higher frequency data, look at the components, all the different aspects. And that's what I appreciate about this particular approach. It tries to really look at the complexity and not ignore the complexity that's behind the impact of, let's say, extreme climate events, right? And that involves, you know, government policy, that involves uh, recognizing a lot of these economies have been dealing with these events, well, since the beginning, they started. There's a lot of informal insurance mechanisms and all these things. So, so my particular research looks at the impact, and I think uh, some of the results I have, uh, you know, just provide support for the sort of approach you're taking. So, for instance, when I started looking at more high-frequency data, so usually one looks at annual data because that's what's available. You actually see, if you remember the graph that was here now, explained on two occasions in two very different ways, you see exactly that sort of thing. There's this sort of initial drop, so that's the initial damage, right? Then there's sort of the indirect business interruptions, all these things that kind of goes down. And then there's this kind of very long, sometimes medium-term recovery, right? And in the data, you can't really see so much difference when you, let's say, statistical analysis, because different economies seem to react differently. And, and the question then is why, and I think it has to do with this resilience uh, question in this regard. And when you start then looking in the black box further, there's lots of evidence that kind of indicates that that is an important issue. So for instance, if you take, let's say, gross national product or gross uh, domestic product that I look at and you divide it in its components, you see, for instance, in the first year investment goes up. That makes sense because, you know, they have to reinvest in infrastructure and those things. But then three or four years later, investment goes down again. And what that indicates to me is, of course, okay, these economies use their current expenditure to invest in infrastructure and rebuilding resilience and those sort of things. But then somebody has to pay for it later on. And if they had concessional finance for this, then they could forego those sort of losses and the long-term implications it has for that. If you look at the external sector, for instance, you find imports rise in the beginning. That's probably with the uh, import of um, construction material, foodstuff of agricultural sectors um, uh, damaged in this regard. And then you find two or three late years later, exports fall again. Right? So it clearly has some indirect implications on the rest of the economy. I think the most interesting thing is you find that uh, in terms of, let's say, consumption by private households, that goes down two or three years later, right? And I'll just maybe speak a little bit later if it comes to another question about why that is. But of course, you find that government consumption goes up, right? And that's an important issue because when you then divide it and look into revenue and expenditure, you find that instantly revenue goes down, right? And that's the whole idea behind this catastrophic uh, Caribbean catastrophe risk insurance facility to have governments get over that initial one when revenue is not coming in because people are not spending, they can't pay public wages and those sort of things. But then, of course, what you find in the longer term, so for several months and years, expenditure goes up. But of course, what does that mean? You're spending uh, more, but you're taking in less income. So debt levels go up, right? They stay up for a very long time. And the alarming thing is most of that debt seems to be uh, financed by foreign debt, right? And if you already have economies that have a high debt level, and you have to borrow on the foreign market, what's going to happen? They're going to charge you high rates. So I think you kind of get pushed into this very long, vicious cycle. You owe more at higher rates, and it's difficult to pay back. So building some sort of resilience in that regard in terms of financing or realizing that or categorizing countries according to the debt level could be very helpful. There's other interesting aspects. If you look sort of at what I call the monetary sector, you find foreign reserves immediately fall. That makes sense with imports rising and exports falling in this regard. And we know all the problems that come from foreign reserves. You find then that, and I guess for a lot of Caribbean countries, this is a big issue that uh, central banks that push kind of fixed exchange rate policies, they're a little bit buffered with that, but still there's an impact on that regard. Um, as Dr. Nurse was uh, mentioning in terms of the food sector, you know, if you look at inflation, 
that goes up immediately, that's going to be very costly, and particularly it's food inflation. So you have agrarian economies destroyed, households with less income, and then food prices go up, and house prices as well. So the cost on the individual households is relatively large. So you have these factors there. You can also break down the economies into the individual sectors. So I'm just going to focus on the two main ones, in part because that's where mostly data is in there. Tourism, as you would expect, there's a big fall in tourism for a few months. Uh, you find it a little bit larger for cruise versus uh, air arrivals tourism, and that's, of course, a big issue in that regard. And on the one hand, you know, there's always the argument that cruise uh, tourism doesn't add so much into a local economy, but they seem to react larger, right? And it's partially, from what I understand, is these big tourism um, carbon cruise companies, they have these packages and they can instantly adjust if Antigua is hit by a hurricane, they just move a, a destination somewhere else. Uh, air arrivals, you also have an impact. Um, in terms of agricultural sector, it can be up to one or two years. It depends if it's the banana sector. So you have these big sectors being impacted now. It doesn't look like in the long term, but that doesn't mean it doesn't feed into the economy. And there's these really long-term effects here. As a matter of fact, I remember when I first started to do this research and I focused just on GDP. You know, after a lot of work, I was very proud of it. And I presented in front of, I think it was a general uh, audience. I think it was in Jamaica at a Sir Arthur Lewis uh, Social and Economic Research Institute. And I, I started to show the impact and I said, well, you know, it was something about the average hurricane causes a 7%, I think, drop in growth, and then it disappears. And I remember there was somebody in the audience who was an academic, and they raised their hand and they say, you know, Dr. Strobel, I find your results offensive because the IMF is going to come in and say, well, look, Dr. Strobel said it only lasts a year, so we have nothing to worry about, whereas I know my cousin is still suffering from seven years ago when the hurricane hit. So I think, you know, the way you approach with this particular index, understanding the complexity, I mean, it's a very challenging task, as says. I guess you know better than me, but it really is an understanding of how these events impact economies. And I think with a simple thing like G&I, it's, it's just not going to help a lot of countries. You can, some countries are going to get finance uh, when they probably don't need it, and other ones are not going to get it when they really do need it, right? And that's just going to exasperate this, and, and it's like a treadmill. And you see the same sort of things with, you know, what we in the literature call, but what the Mr. President called about uh, these... Um, when you have an event following another one, we call them cascade or compound events, and there's ongoing literature in that, and it really seems to make a difference in there. Because if you're hit with a hurricane two years later, you still have a high debt levels, then it goes up again, households are trying to recover, and those sort of things, you know, it's, uh, it has a long-term impact. And by dividing it up into these different sections, you know, classifying countries according to the relevant indicators, I think it's going to be very helpful in terms of getting these countries, you know, to move forward and become more resilient internally. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks very much for that. Um, <laughs> thanks for those insights, Professor uh, Strobel. Uh, you mentioned the cycle of recovery, growth, impact, uh, and the expenditures that then have to be undertaken to you know, recover from the impact. And in many instances, what is happening is that countries like ours are spending twice on the same productive capacity. So, you know, you've incurred debt twice to pretty much uh, achieve the same level of, of, of production. And this is what helps uh, in terms of causing the debt overhang that we, we see. Of course, you mentioned also the important uh, issue of export concentration, the fact that these countries are highly exposed to a single um, export sector and this manifests itself in frequent starts and stops as far as, as um, GDP is concerned. So um, thanks, for those, thanks for those insights. So I'm going to have uh, another round of um, questions. We, I think we have half an hour. Uh, of course, I'm willing to interrupt if I see any hands raised, anyone wants to to ask a question, but if not, I'm going to go to a second round of questions, and I'm going to ask uh, Ambassador Webson. Uh, now, there's been a lot of discussion on how best to incorporate vulnerability and resilience in a framework that can support the long-term sustainable development of uh, developing countries. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on the current perspectives on how this framework can help SIDS build more resilient economies, Ambassador? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much again, uh, Mr. Moderator, and thanks to the members of the panel for this really very important and exciting discussion. I just thought I'll raise um, 
uh, uh, before I answer the question directly, just to, to Mr. Nurse, maybe we should have a conversation offline around your role within the, um, the committee, and also maybe we should get the, um, the expert panel to speak to the ECOSOC group a little bit, because as we think of the situation and the, the, two, the three measures you use, while, vulnerable, while um, the environmental measure cannot change because of our geography, which makes us beautiful, but makes us most beautifully vulnerable as well. We, uh, education, which is one of the big human index measurement, the OECS, of which there are several, a few OECS countries who have graduated and are in there, their situation, the OECS was defined as the most, that having the weakest education struct, uh, graduates, the least graduates, and one of the weakest structures in the, East, in the Caribbean. And yet, some of their countries, because of their GNI, has, has reached that level of graduation. So maybe those are some things that we might want to have a, a greater discussion on at some point. Um, more to the point of the question, today, small island states, the economies are, as you know, ravaged by numerous um, external shocks. The COVID-19 has, has not only eroded the public health system in many, uh, many of these countries, but it has also slashed, really slashed, important um, sources of income. It has damaged, as we talked earlier, the tourism industry. It has damaged remittances, which is an important part of many, many small islands, whether they're in the East, the Pacific, or the Caribbean region. And it has increased debt levels from severe to, as we say in the Caribbean, crucial. It has really moved, the, moved it to significant levels with, 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 at, 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 at frightening levels. We heard this morning most Caribbean islands are over 60% and some are over 100% to their GDP. Sudden and gradual shocks from climate change continue to, be, to plague us and injure our, our in economies. Um, slow onsets, of course, hurricanes and other natural disasters has crippled um, the vital infrastructure and, and has really wrecked small islands' economies. And we must now think of the, the impacts, like, like loss, of, loss of agriculture, many of the things we have already spoken of here this afternoon, what that has on, on, on any, any prospect of stability and building. The MVI must be seen to improve access for um, these vulnerable small islands to financing from and enable us to build resilience in a, in a sort of a, a cons constant and sustainable manner. And that, for, that sort of falls into what we are talking about, building resilience for the future. And uh, that's what we talk in the climate space about mitigation. And example, if, let's get, if, if I'm to be practical here, many of the SIDS are e essentially bad from access to ODA, development aid, currently because of the failing uh, that they, they, they meet the outdated standards, right, that we talked about, the outdated GNI measurement. And that has barred many of us small island states from receiving any sort of support. And, 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 and to expand eligibility, we believe, for ODA, we have to look at this new criteria that we are talking about so much today. And in order that we can, we, we talk a lot about building an increasing investment. And as, as Dr. Dr. Nurse said, you know, the banks like to talk about money. So we, we have, to talk <clears throat> have to talk about increasing investment through finance and so on. And if we're going to do that, we have to allow these islands an opportunity to receive financial, concessional financing. Not, that they, not, not to, to just to rebuild, but to rebuild for the future and to address the questions that was placed before us by Dr. Nurse. And that will be helpful in terms of. For as you know, it, as it stands now, everything for small island states is far more expensive than any other um, group of islands. Climate, the climate crisis is more expensive for us to recover from. Debt is more expensive for small islands. As you, I'm sure as you follow the, the current crisis, you realize that developed countries can borrow at ridiculously low rates while small island nations, states, 
have to borrow at some very expensive rates, very high rates, and that, that, that cannot be part of how the global community should develop. Um, we talked of food being expensive, and just the whole picture is, is, does not work well for us. Debt relief mechanisms for, the, for, for most um, vulnerable countries that must be in place. The framework that we talk about can allow small islands to better manage their public debt, which have grown in, 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 in the last, especially during this crisis. And I use the word grown very lightly because it hasn't grown, it has ballooned in many countries. Our debt is dangerously um, over, over, over leveraged, and we are essentially, and really for all intents and purposes, we are both figuratively and practically underwater. As I said in a speech a couple, couple months ago, if debt don't drown us, we'll be drowned by the oceans from hurricanes. So greater control over debt will also allow us to focus on public health and other, other um, priorities spending to build resilience in, in, coastal, in coastal communities like these islands. Um, they, they, there are ways here that the MVI can enable small islands to develop more sustainable and um, uh, to be more resilient in our economies and would be the tool that we can use working together and coupling it with things like the RDA, working together to be able to plan better, manage our economies better, and to be able to, uh, to clear, have a clearer pathway. So we do not, after each disaster, have to ask or reach out. It is understood what the setback of the disaster. And the Caribbean is a classic example of how these things happen. As I said earlier, every two or three years, the Caribbean can expect a category five hurricane. If some island will be hit. And that island may be one that has been graduated and, it, uh, and the graduation that the, the international community said is the only graduation that anyone knows where nobody is happy to graduate. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Now we, we have a question from the audience and I'm gonna invite um, Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. A really, really interesting conversation and one which I, I know everyone in the room uh, is on the same page and really excited about how we move forward this agenda together. Uh, two questions, if I may, just really quickly. Um, so the first is about data quality. So um, I, I, when we watched that presentation, I think that uh, the methodology looked really robust. I'm sure it overwhelmed all of us. Um, I even did a, a degree with advanced econometrics, and I still didn't understand any of it. Um, <laughs> but we trust, we trust it's a robust methodology. Um, but, but I guess the key tends to then be about data quality. So what we put in, of course, is going to heavily influence what, we, what comes out. So at the moment, um, if you were to have two different rooms, an economist in different rooms, and they were to put their own data in, um, you know, would we be getting the same type of outputs? Or is, is a lot of the data subjective? Or, or do we not have the data quality we need yet? And if, if that's the case, can we build it? You know, what, you know thinking about the, uh, the theme of the conference about, about measuring better and targeting better. So uh, I'd really love to hear about data quality and what we can do in that space. Uh, a second question, if I may, um, and this one is, is, is just to ask for further clarification in the methodology about what is in the control of countries. So when I look at what, how the World Bank allocates IDA at the moment, it uses GNI per capita, but it also uses a country policy and institutional assessments. So that's basically 16 uh, criteria um, that judge basically how sound a country's policies are. So it allocates money based on GNI per capita plus an assessment of how responsible policies are. So, so when we compare the RDA, um, could I, I, it would be good just to not compare against GNI per capita, but it would be good to understand how does the RDA include assessments of what countries are doing themselves as well. So that, that aspect as well. 
Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Ian, before you go, can you identify yourself? I, I am Ian Mills, um, uh, yeah, from the UK. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks Ian. And, and please, when you're asking your questions, please uh, identify yourselves uh, at the lectern. So the, the second question is interesting because I think it synthesizes uh, some points that um, have been made by the individual panelists um, in the sense that it separates uh, or, or it points to the separation of what a country has control over. And you talk, uh, Dr. Nurse, about return on, 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 uh, on investment, but also the vulnerabilities which have been identified by, I guess, all panelists. So I'm gonna throw that question out. I don't know who wants to take it. Um, well, the two questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to impose one more rule. <laughs> um, panelists, anyone wants to take those two questions? So the two questions, one relates to data quality. Um, is the data good enough? Uh, and and uh, are the results that we get out of it uh, credible? Uh, and and uh, as well a clarification on the methodology about what is in control of the country, what is in control of the country, and what is not. Uh, I'm going to give... I'm, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to give the I'm going to give the panelists the opportunity to, to respond to the question, and then, President, I'm going to uh, uh, I may allow you to come in. I, I haven't I haven't decided yet. <laughs> yeah, after you, I want. I Thanks, Doctor. Let, let, let me take a, a bit of a stab. I'm not going to answer the questions um, specifically or directly because I, I I knew that. You all had a range of questions to me, and in fact, they, they dovetail with what um, the other Ian uh, uh, has asked. Um, at the UN Committee for Development Policy, we have adopted a, a, an increasingly differential stance, which is rather than just waiting for countries to arrive at some graduation threshold, we're now thinking, how can we help them get to the graduation thresholds. And once they get there, how do we facilitate their smooth transition from the, from into this graduated state? Because with graduation comes a reduction in terms of access to international support measures, like concessionary financing. So that's the key point. The other things, so for example, um, access to certain tariff free or low, low tariff access to certain markets, which is really important, for example, for a country like Bangladesh, which is currently an LDC, and a lot of its exports, particularly clothing and textile exports, um, enjoy uh, a number of trade policy mechanisms that give them access to certain markets, right? Uh, but it also includes other things in relation, for example, to their pharmaceutical industry. But what we find, though, is for the least developed countries is that um, many of them, even when they have access to these international support measures, are unable to access them. We did a study about three years ago, and it was a bit of a surprise to us. So, the international support measures, which includes not just concessionary financing or trade access, they may even involve access to you know, green financing or climate financing and so on. And what we are observing is that many of these, particularly small states, don't have the administrative capacity to go through all the hoops and the high transactional costs and the high administrative costs to access these international support measures. So who are these measures designed for, um, one can ask. And so it may well look good on paper, but in reality, the capacity of these countries to access these things is very limited. So, so one of the things that we've been working on, and we're doing this in collaboration with other agencies, is to improve and to create a level of coordination among the various UN agencies so that we can help the countries 
access these measures, because having them on paper alone is not going to make a difference. So I think that that, that is a really important dimension which is not necessarily well articulated in the literature or in the media. The other thing is this that we are doing is, and this is, comes to Jason's presentation and the key point that I think he's made, is that many of the traditional um, uh, data sets focused on vulnerability are backward looking. It tells you what has happened in the past. Um, so it's, you're looking in a rear view mirror as opposed to looking through your, you know, the front glass of the car um, and seeing what's coming down the pipeline. And so that's why the internal resistance capacity Resilience. I keep getting it wrong, man. <laughs> resilience capacity. In internal resilience, resilience capacity. capacity, yes. No. But this internal resilience capacity needs to be countenanced by an understanding of what's coming down the pipeline. So you need to be projecting into the future, 10 years, 20 years down the line, what are the key issues that are going to be impacting on these economies. And this is where you need a new set of data. So to come back to, uh, to Ian's point, the other Ian's point, it's what data do we need to assess these countries' capacity in terms of resilience is not just what they have on the ground now, is our assessment of what's coming down the pipeline. Okay? And that means then we need to be um, projecting into the future and setting up a range of mechanisms. So one of the things that we are doing in the UN Committee for Development Policy is we have constructed something called Enhanced Monitoring Mechanism, where we identify a, a, a suite of indicators which tell us when a country is in crisis or going into crisis. It's sort of like an early warning mechanism. And so we've been looking at a range of um, data sets. And this is where, so for, for example, I worked on um, Tuvalu and Caribas. Wow, I mean, we think we have a challenge here in the Caribbean. Well, <laughs> um, look at the Pacific. Mm -hmm. um, the level of data and quality of data is very challenging. However, we apply the 80-20 rule, which is that we can take proxies and use those because we know historically that this is an indicator. So for example, when a hurricane or a disaster hits a particular developing country, we know a couple things happen. One, first off, the use of telecoms go up. <laughs> Everybody's sending messages to everyone. And then when the telecoms infrastructure crashes, <laughs> no telecoms. Mm -hmm. So you know almost immediately if you are tracking just the telecoms data for a country whether it's been hit by a crisis or not. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happens, and really so what um, Ambassador Webson mentioned in part, is that we know that when a disaster hits a country like our own, um, remittances and the support from our diaspora communities jumps very quickly. In fact, they are more responsive than all the intergovernmental agencies and the UN agencies and so on. Because we, we do know, and that's another data we, we are attempting to attract, is that many of the international agencies and the foreign governments make commitments very early, but when you track the disbursements, there's a huge gap between the commitments <laughs> and, the, and the disbursements. Absolutely. Hmm? Right? The money never shows up in many instances. True. So that's something that we need to be tracking as well. And what I'm suggesting is this, is that by and large, we have most of the data that we need to make a fairly critical assessment. We don't have to overthink the thing, all right? We, we, we already know historically what the impacts are, and, and my, my colleague, um, Professor Strobel, I think really highlighted the key elements. You could see the impact that it has on exports, imports, internal consumption, and these things. These are fairly standard now. And so let us use what we have and get moving. 
rather than waiting for the for perfection in terms of the data sets. Uh, what was the expression? Don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. Um, I think that applies here. So I, I hope I've responded adequately enough, um, Mr. Moderator. Yes, uh, thanks. Um, just want to note your resistance <laughs> to resilience. <laughs> okay. And I need, I need it for you to adjust that. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, um, look, I want to I wanna bring in our online um, audience uh, because there will be an additional opportunity for uh, the, the, the audience in the room, uh, you know, to, to have a chat after we close off. And I don't want for our online um, audience to miss an opportunity to engage the panelists. Uh, and I think that this is a very interesting question. I know that there will be quite a few uh, of you jumping at the bit to respond to it, uh, including Jason and the president, who is not going to get a chance to <laughs> respond <laughs> before we, we, we close off. But look, can a similar model be designed for anticipatory actions uh, stroke adaptation? Is that, uh, is, that, is, is that in the making? I assume that should be. Uh, is that in the making? I, I want to assure you that it is. And this is what the RD is about. But let me allow Jason to, to handle that question. Okay, thank you. Thank you, moderator. You're coming back to the data quality question, I hope. But I will. Uh, I will. Let, let me ask I the will. immediate question. The vulnerability and resilience assessment tool, in essence, is, is seeking to do that. The assessment tool seeks to look into uh, the, what is happening in terms of the policy and institutional environment. There was a question uh, by the gentleman before that was saying, um, uh, how does the CPIA uh, fit into this framework? Well, the vulnerability and resilience assessment tool, in the CPIA, because what we're seeking to, to assess is the quality of the policy and institutional framework. So, so uh, existing indicators like the CPIA, we're not, we're not seeking to reinvent the wheel, but we, we're utilizing frameworks like that, the, the uh, CPIA, uh, the debt sustainability what they, analysis. What CPIA oh, is. oh yes, the oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yes, the the country poverty and institutional assessment that is used by the World Bank. It is used uh, by the CDB and international organizations. What it seeks to do is to give a sense as to the the strength of the policy and institutional environment in in a country. So it looks at various areas. It would look at the country's fiscal policy, it will look at its monetary policy, trade, etc. Uh, a deeper diagnostic, as it will, to give a sense as to uh, what are the what are the policy prescriptions the country has done in order to strengthen its ability to withstand the shock. And so, in our uh, vulnerability and resilience assessment tool, we are taking those existing tools, which are internationally recognized and allowing that to feed into our diagnosis of how we come up with these policy prescriptions. I will, I will stop there. All right, thank you. Um, so we have, let me see if I can take one more from, from our, we have uh, nine more minutes. Um, it, this question here says, should the question of debt forgiveness be part of this conversation? Let me throw that out. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Strobel. I mean, that's one of those very difficult questions. And the discussion is really, you know, it's kind of what we economists, well, there's three economists here on the board, as far as I can tell. I'm not sure if you're also an economist, uh, Ambassador. Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's well. probably an insulting question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It is a very difficult question to answer, but we and um, answering it within this context is particularly challenging. But within the context of the crisis that we face, we have been raising um, to the economic, to ECOSOC and others, the whole issue of debt forgiveness and and um, and and debt relief. We have a, in the globe. We have uh, uh, we have done this before through HIPAA. And we have been saying for small island states, debt forgiveness should be in the discussion, at least, as we consider um, 
the, 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 the challenges we, we face as small island nations. Um, before you close, though, and I, I want to go back to the data question. So I'll come back to that when you're ready. All right. Um, thanks. So um, we have seven minutes left. Uh, Mr. President, can you respond to that question in uh, three minutes? <laughs> three minutes? Uh, I, I'm putting you on the clock. <laughs> Oh, yeah. you to to I, I could, yeah. yeah. I mean, depending on. Oh, I thought you were. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. So, did you have some of my seconds? You need to reset the clock. No, 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 no. You were taking up some of your seconds. No. No, start, start. <laughs> no I was going to make. I was going to make two points. One is that the framework that is used, the IRC, is a function, not only of vulnerability but of resilience yeah. and resilience has five buckets one of which is institutional resilience so the point you made about the um, the CPIA as being part of is clearly integrated within the framework and we that is one of the things we do is we emphasize we have a framework not an index and how you model this allows you to open it to all of the points I think Ian was, was making. The second on data quality I think was touched by, by Keith. Uh, data by definition is always looking in the review mirror. It's happened. That's what makes it data. And so your role is to use the data you have to be able to project forward. And so the focus of having a forward-looking line is to move from post-mortem analysis into pre-mortem analysis. And I think that's the point, uh, Keith, you're making. And so it becomes a matter of how well you model such that you have projections of the impact going forward. And it won't be data, it will be projections, which by definition you can use. So if we take um, Ian's point, you will never be able to confirm <laughs> until the data occurs. So you will always have two, three, four, ten economists that may differ. But the role you want to be able to do is to be able to project. And if we just think of climate, when I say the vulnerability has changed before and after an event, the state and evolution of climate change before an event and after an event are clearly different you will not be able to observe the climate change impact after the event occurs because then it's history, you know, it, it's already occurred. But if you know and can model how climate is actually evolving, climate change is evolving, <coughs> then in principle you could say your resilience, your internal resilience capacity, which is a function of how the climate change dynamic is changing, means you can incorporate into that duration element of your IRC a movement in the change in the evolution of climate change. In other words, if you were to start with a 1.1 and you end up with a 2.8 or a 1.8, the vulnerabilities are very different. But my ability to grow, to be, go beyond recovery, to move into the potential zone that you talk about, will depend very critically on whether I end up at 1.2 or whether I end up at 1.8. But if my vulnerability is based on 1.1, I clearly am not going to be able to capture that. And when we say forward-looking, we need to be able to incorporate, if climate were to change to now 1.6, what does that mean in terms of your ability to be resilient? And that is that forward-looking component that you need to be able to model to give you a sense of the duration that we are talking about. So data has, has that dimension as well. It's a backward looking always, but it's the, the forward looking aspect that you need to be able to capture through modeling of what you're trying to do, yeah. All right, thanks, thanks President. Um, so I'm gonna give you a few seconds to respond to the data question and then we're gonna wrap up for our online audience. Of course. The that forgiveness, forgiveness of this, yeah. That forgiveness. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, coming back to that. So, you know, from a purely economist perspective, there's that question of moral hazard, right? And, and it's, it's uh, our usual abstraction of what human behavior is. So the worry, I think, in principle is, at least by economists, if, if one were to forgive deaths, then what is the incentive for not accumulating debt again? 
So that'd be pure economics. Now we know in reality it's not like that because there's many different issues about fairness, those sort of things. One could ask the question, why are a lot of these countries in debt in the first place? And there you could go back as far to you know, colonial times as being part of the reason. So that's one issue. So you know, the roundabout way, I think, to get around it is to think about conditional forgiveness of debt here. Of course, that then brings the, the question of what, under what conditions, you know, if we forgive your a particular country's debt, what do they have to do in turn? What do they have to commit to? And that gets, of course, into other more complicated questions. So I think it's important questions because clearly once these economies reach a certain debt level, it's just going to be very difficult to get back to anything that one could call resilience. So somehow one has to bring them down. So there has to be some sort of forgiveness to some extent. Should it be full forgiveness? How much? And then, of course, comes the issue if you forgive, let's say, the debt in Grenada, if it's very high, what about other African countries that are high debt? So it's, it's a complicated issue, much more complicated, I think, we as economists can kind of abstract from it, but it's an important question. I don't think the answer is clearly no or yes, but it's just complicated. It's something there has to be a lot of discussion on uh, from economists and other people in the social science, policymakers in the East, all these sort of things. So I'm giving you a very academic answer, which is <laughs> Thanks. who knows. Thanks, Thanks Professor. Um, and on that note, um, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I think that we had a very, very good discussion. And I want to thank the panelists for. for I want to thank the audience, both here with us physically and the audience online as well. So thank you very much. All right. So good. We can continue the discussion if.